Welcome to Movie Class by Pizza Flicks. Please stay tuned for today's program, but first, some tasty tidbits from your host. 20 years, 50 films, major movies with major movie stars. But chances are, you probably don't recall seeing or have ever heard the beautiful starlet Dorothy Abbott. Like the legions of young pretties that preceded her, she left her small town hoping to make it big in Tinseltown. After two years of being cast as showgirls, models, nurses, or the girl at a party, she finally caught a break. A speaking line in 1948's Night Has a Thousand Eyes. When a person's faded, others go with her. Too bad it didn't do much for a fledging career. Sure, she appeared in the popular movies of the day as a contract player with Paramount, MGM, or Fox, but Dorothy continued to just beautify her scenes silently. In 1949, she fell hard for a tough cop. While other Hollywood hopefuls were chasing agents and producers in the Coconut Grove or the Brown Derby, Dorothy married Rudy Diaz, an LAPD narcotic squad detective. TV's top cop show Dragnet picked a couple of Rudy's cases to dramatize, but Hubby signed on as technical advisor, it didn't take long for Dorothy to be noticed by Jack Webb, a.k.a. Sergeant Joe Friday. In her first episode, she appeared as Ann Baker, a model. Soon her role was expanded as Friday's girlfriend. But after just five more episodes, Ann Baker was gone. Early in her career, Dorothy put in two months as a Vegas showgirl at the Flamingo, where she quickly earned the title, The Girl with the Golden Arm. Turns out her true calling was gambling, which probably doomed her dancing days in Sin City. Dorothy may have been lucky at the gambling tables, but not in love. Although they had a daughter together, the couple was living separately by the 1960s. Scandal sheets reported spotting Rudy out on the town with actress Ann Southern. In 1968, a year after Rudy retired from the LAPD, the couple divorced. And then, tragically that December, the day before her 48th birthday, Dorothy Abbott took her own life. And now, our feature presentation. In 1952, Dorothy appeared in this little curio produced by the co-founder of the Pussycat Theater chain. In her only starring role, she plays Dara Sloan, a small-town reporter sent undercover to investigate the seamy side of Hollywood. small-town girl who came to the big sea. Let's her speeding along toward her dates with fate. Wide-eyed with excitement. Ah, yes, I remember well this girl. Then so naive and innocent. Because this girl was me. Little did I suspect that bright day the startling adventures just waiting to happen to me in the city ahead. If I had known then all that would have happened to me, I might have turned the car about and raced away from this place twice as fast as I was speeding toward it. Rounding a curve, I break my car to a stop on a hill high above the city I had heard so much about all of my life. Bright fires of excitement. 
were sparkling inside me as I ran forward for a first look at it. There below me, a bit smoggy, lay fabulous Hollywood. Astounding adventures awaited me down there. But quickly, my thoughts jumped back to my home of Greenfield, the newspaper office where I worked, the afternoon I had been summoned into the office of our editor, a man who both fascinated and frightened me. <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Hanson? Yes? You sent for me? Oh, uh, yes, I, I did, Miss Sloan. I uh, wanted to have a little uh, talk with you. Very uh, confidential. You see, for uh, some time now, I've been thinking about you. Why, what would you be thinking about me? Well, you'd be surprised. Oh. Why, Miss Sloan, you're, you're not afraid of me, are you? I guess I do have a kind of a reputation that frightens most girls in this town, but tell me, Miss Sloan, do you think I'm a big bad wolf? Miss Sloan, as I was saying, I, I've uh, been thinking about you, and uh, do you know what people in Hollywood do? I, I mean, do you know what actually goes on out there? Well, no, I... You, you don't know, Miss Sloan, because everything you read or hear about the movie city contradicts everything else you read or hear about it. Uh, like this, for instance, today's paper. It's here on page one. There. Hollywood investigator claims belly dancers perform nearly naked in swank strip spot. Or this juicy item, screen star spits in critic's eye, scores bull's eye. Now these are the news headlines, but listen to what film fan reporter writes in her column. There. I've always found screen stars to be innately kind and polite. Now, I always thought anyone that spit in your eye was downright impolite. And this, no matter what scandalous tales you hear about our city, the truth is nothing unusual happens here. But take a look at this. Naked woman on motorcycle outraces police through streets near Hollywood. A naked dame racing bareback and bare everything else through the streets. I suppose that's not unusual for Hollywood. And listen to this sugar broadcast by Prunella Skipper. The movie actress Donna Sterling is just the sweetest girl I know. All her troubles have been due to her being just too generous to people, especially men. She just can't say no to anyone. Especially men. The poor, misunderstood child is rushing to the arms of her only true love in Las Vegas, just as soon as she gets a divorce from her fifth husband in Reno. See what I mean? Here's a city that everybody wants to read about hear about, but everything you hear about it is contradictory. What kind of place actually is Hollywood? That's what everybody in Greenfield and everywhere else would really like to know. So give them the answer, the real low down with no punches pulled, and I'll bet we double the start time circulation. And whatever that is, good or bad, we're going to print it. Should be sensational. Yes, go to Hollywood and find out. Actually, do yourself everything they do out there. You know what I mean? Me? Why not? You have all the uh, equipment necessary for the job. But I wouldn't know how. I'm confident there'll be plenty of applicants to teach you how. But I haven't had any experience. I'll bet you won't say that when you come back. Well, Mr. Hansen's words had made me curious. I turned and raced back to the car, anxious to get down to the city below and discover just what might happen there. Hmm, if I'd have only known. 36 hours later, I was typing my first article for I felt sure what had already happened to me would surprise readers of the Greenfield Star Times.
I headed it, my first day in the land of make-believe. Like most people who come to Hollywood, my first thought upon arrival was, where could I see the movie stars? The simplest way might be to get one of the movie maps advertised along Sunset Boulevard. From a quaint old character, I purchased one, guaranteed to list the home addresses of 300 movie celebrities. And so, I set out to see the stars. You think all these glamour boys and girls live on vast estates? Ha! Huh. According to my map, most of their homes were on out-of-the-way streets. And nobody I asked had the slightest idea just where. The houses listed were hardly the type I had anticipated. And anyway, even people in Greenfield weren't going to get too excited by hearing I'd seen the spot where Joe Starr hung his hat. But I decided, then and there, whatever I had to do to thrill my readers, I would do. My first adventure, however, happened by accident. Somehow, I got lost in the Hollywood Hills. Looking for someone to give me directions, I saw a strange figure. I waved. Whoever, whatever it was, disappeared behind a high stone wall. Curious, I got out of my car. The place had a foreboding look. But I was lost. Anyway, I was seeking strange experiences. This looked like a place where you would certainly find them. My woman's curiosity urged me to go on. My feet kept wanting to turn back. Somehow the place was weird. A perfect setting for ghouls and ghosts and horrible happenings. And I had a strong premonition that something awful was about to happen to me. Wherever I looked, I could find no one. But I could feel hidden eyes fastened on my every movement. It was a creepy place. Also, not one for high-heeled shoes. I tried to act calmly, but inside, my nerves were whipping up a small-sized panic. Suddenly, something jumped up in the bushes behind me. I screamed. Now I was frightened. It seemed I had stumbled into the ruins of an old castle, a haunted castle. I ran until I lost my breath, and then I saw a thing. Where was the gate? I was running around wildly trying to find it when I stumbled and fell flat. I lay there, afraid to look up, because I heard the sound of feet closing in on me. When I did look up, a fence of legs encircled me. And the tallest man I had ever seen towered over me. The man motioned for me to get up.
I saw now that the legs belonged to some very pretty girls. Even the hideous head that had scared me was only a mask for a beautiful girl. A few words made me understand everything. I had happened onto a studio ranch used by photographers and cameramen who make the artistic type of photos and films. These girls were a group of models who posed for them. They had hidden at my approach because onlookers were usually a nuisance. Since they had not been able to scare me away, however, everyone went back to work. There were several groups of professional photographers around. But, as one of the models pointed out, some of the photographers used the picture-making gag just as an excuse to get acquainted with and ogle girls. Sometimes they had film in their camera, sometimes not. Later, promising to stay out of camera range, I wandered about, looking at different groups at work. In one secluded spot, an artist was daubing at a canvas. After a while, the artist had an idea, and his idea he should paint less of the model's costume and more of the model. Then the artist began to get the same idea again. He should paint less of the model's costume and even more of her. Well, that same idea just kept coming back to the artist. But at last the model said, Wait a minute, just what kind of a painting is this masterpiece of yours? And then she saw what she had been posing for. Well, this artist would either have to improve his art or find a model with less temper. Between posing scenes, the model sought out hideaway corners in which to sunbathe. And even all over tan was particularly desirable for color shots, they told me. I made notes of what I saw. But the startling beauty of one flame-haired model had me fumbling for adjectives. Innumerable 
adorable young peacocks roamed all over the ranch, and this girl threw breadcrumbs to them. But the peacocks refused to come near enough for her to pet them. As one photographer exclaimed, silly birds. This model, I learned later, was Linnell, top favorite among the lens men who do covers for magazines. Her fiery golden hair, falling down over her cream white body, resulted in the most sensational color shots. The hot rays of the sun were beaming down now, and when I saw one of the girls doing a scene for a movie in a pool, I really envied her. Been a very interesting afternoon watching the production of artistic photos and films. The gorgeous girl type of pictures that feature and star and immortalize glamour, winging their way out from the cinema city to thrill and delight the whole world. As I was leaving, the tall photographer handed me his card. He said he could use me as a model, but I was still a little afraid of him. The third day I was in Hollywood, I received an envelope marked very personal. The letter inside invited me to some very special entertainment, to a show you could see only in Paris or at this French Follies Theater. To ensure admittance, I took the letter and two dollars and found on arrival, the show had already started. of which were about as funny as a contagious disease. And then, several dancers. This was dancing.
to read your latest literary gem for the Star Times. Still, I don't think I'm the type to be a literary critic. Oh, I just want to get the reactions of a common, normal person. <laughs> now, dear, you know I may be common, but not normal. Oh, I'm on to you. You do more talking than anything else. Well, confidentially, I'm better at talking than anything else. Did you model for anyone this week? Yes, I worked yesterday for one of those would-be wolves. He called and said he wanted me for a sitting. Turned out to be more of a running. Do you mean he chased you? Well, what did you do? Well, I let him get close enough a couple of times, you know, to make it interesting. He's too feeble to be a menace. So I got my exercise and five bucks an hour. <laughs> the tales you tell. You should be writing these stories instead of me. Well, your editor might be interested in some of my adventures, but I don't think he'd dare publish them. Well, let's hear how yours sound. My Adventures in Hollywood by Darla Sloan. All right, Darla, I'll read what you wrote and did. After seeing the girls at the French show toss aside all their garments, I convinced myself I might be able to take off a few. So I made a date and went over to pose for the photographer I had met at the ranch. He explained that here at his studio, he made all types of photos. He showed me photos of what he called girls in costume. They looked to me more like girls out of costume. Then tall Tom wondered how my legs would photograph. My way of showing them proved unsatisfactory. Higher, he said, I want to see your legs, not just your feet. To change into a costume, he sent me behind a small screen. While I was changing, I kept thinking back to the day at the ranch when I had looked up and first seen this tall town towering over me. I began to wonder just what he had in mind now. I had heard stories about photographers. There was something sinister about this fellow. We two were here in his studio, alone. I peeked out again. His back was toward me, and then he turned and saw me. He started coming toward me. He came nearer, nearer, near. Oh. And then he said, here, wear these stockings. My behavior must have been strange to him as his actions were to me. The outfit for the first photos actually wasn't too brief. But for some reason, I felt as if I were trying to hide behind three postage stamps. Tall Tom finally pulled out a pair of dark glasses and assured me that wearing them, he was practically blind. After getting me into a pose, he wanted me to smile. I looked about as pleasant as if I were making a date with a dentist. Finally, he promoted a fair expression by having me say, cheese. Maybe this is how they started calling this kind of photography, cheesecake. When he said he wanted an Indian pose, I had one idea, but his was entirely different. Well, if Minnehaha ever posed this way, it 
Must have been when she was loaded with fire water. But even after he snapped it, Tall Tom still called this an Indian pose. I had material for another article, and the photographer and two male customers all had asked me for a date. Well, after reading this, I'd say that when you went back to uh, Greenfield, all the women will hate you, but all the men will want to date you. I wonder what Mr. Hansen, he's our editor, I wonder what he'll think of me. Hmm. I wonder what you think of Mr. Hansen. He's the type of man that makes you not know what to think. He's handsome, but not too. There's something about the way he says things to you, and the way he looks at you, that makes you feel so funny. Did you ever feel as if you'd swallowed an electric vibrator? <sighs> no. But I wouldn't mind to meet this Mr. Hansen. As the slang saying goes, he must be quite a charge. Oh, yes. I guess you could say that. Hmm. Hey, who's the lassie with the cute chassis? Use this in a four-column spread over Darla Sloan's article. Here. Yeah. So that's how Darla Sloan looks. No wonder so many interesting things happen for her to write about. Yes, I guess she's getting plenty of experience. I read all her articles. You know, here in Greenfield, you gotta get your excitement secondhand. Believe me, boss, if what she writes actually happens in Hollywood, she's good. She was good here, too. I wonder what she'll do next. I wonder. Well, Mr. Hansen might have been surprised to know I was thinking of answering a Lonely Heart ad. Not the one who wanted a perfect mate. And I couldn't help the handsome man who needed a wealthy wife. But Mr. Sophisticate, who wanted to show some girl a wonderful evening. He might be just the escort to show me around some unusual night spots. Somehow, his voice was not quite what I expected. But he was eager. One thing I never learned to do, smoke. For this date, though, I wanted to appear worldly wise. But as usual, one drag and I felt as if I were drowning. Oh well, I would just have to act as if I'd been around. The bell buzzed. I primped myself went to the door, opened it, and there was Mr. Sophisticate. With a snoot full of water, I asked this character if he wanted me to take his hat, so... It seems in his hat, he brought his own lunch. Oh, this boy was a card. I bet he'd have been the life of a party somewhere back in the gay 90s. And that's where he should have been. He was full of tricks. And he punctuated each one with a jab in the ribs. Did I know he made big money? He showed me. Big money. Rib jab. I made the mistake of being coaxed to look at his lapel flower. But I was ready for his next rib jab. This literally had him rolling on the floor.
Next, had I ever seen the three stooges? You know, one butted the other with his head, the second kicked the first in the pants. Foolishly, I asked what the third did. Mr. Sophisticate showed me. By now, I'd figured out a little game myself. It started out sort of simple-like. Maybe that's why my newfound pal immediately took to it. But as my game progressed, it became a little more complicated. Jabber told me he had never tried this blind man's waltz before, but it was nothing but fun. I told him I knew he'd get a kick out of it. And he was Mr. Sophisticate? I crossed Mr. Sophisticate definitely if my lid. Another ad caught my eye. Well, Wonder how it would be to have a date with a Hollywood actor. The next evening, though, when the buzzer sounded, I had almost decided not to answer it. But I knew he was completely different from Mr. Sophisticate. The moment he stepped inside the door and said, I am Sir Reginald Reginald. Uh, Mr. Sir Reginald, uh, won't you sit down? You may call me by my first name. states that you're in the theatrical profession. Sir, oh, yes. I'm a thespian, an actor, you understand, from the theater, the legitimate theater. Ah, you should have seen me in Shakespeare. To be, or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind... But now you're in pictures. Gad, yes. All day I've been performing in some cow drama. Oh, uh, a western. Uh, what part did you play? The line was, uh, they went that way. It's five different characters in five different makeups. I said, ah, they went that way. I think they went that way. Uh, I don't frankly do, but uh, I think they went that way. I don't know, but uh, they went that way, I think. <coughs> the one of the voice is losing its resonance. Uh, you uh, don't happen to have something to drink, have you? Would you like a drink of water? My dear, I want to drink, not bathe. A previous tenant had generously left behind two bottles of wine in the refrigerator. I proudly brought forth one for Sir Reginald. He looked at the label, muttered something about domestic. Maybe it was because the wine wasn't imported. Anyway, that boy had a way of drinking without tasting. Well, I gulped one too. But I soon found, no matter how I did it, I couldn't empty glasses as fast as my noble friend. Sir Reginald finished the first bottle in a breeze. The second bottle about finished Sir Reginald. And worst of all, 
Old Demon Rum began to bring forth in Ye Old Thespian all the different characters he had ever played. And then Chico falls to the floor and he disappears for a second and then I come up into my amazing scene. Oh my dear, if you could see me now. Oh, oh. I played everything, even animals. <coughs> Perhaps you saw me uh, as the Avenger, the Sun's Fury. Oh, what a scene. The sort of thing the audiences love. I beat the heroine for two reels. What? A romantic scene. I really beat her, you understand, for two full reels. How do those lines go? Die it. But last me proud beauty. Die the Avenger have uncovered your treachery with a hundred lashes of the whip. I'll wipe out your disgrace. Ah! 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 Yes, she ran from me, but I was after her. And now, in punishment for your perfidiousness, ah! I wanted him to see what's the matter with you. Haven't you eaten today? Ah, you foxy wench. This what makes me duty more exciting. <laughs> ah, Cinderella! Stop! Peter! For two full reels! Stop twisting and turning and ruining the sea! Peter! Two full reels! Until I was completely done in. Very exhausting scene on me, you understand? I finally went to a nightclub with a gentleman who advertised himself as safe and sound. Well, anyway, he was safe. His hearing wasn't so good, but when they introduced the exotic dancer, Naomi, you could see... Naomi's artistic efforts, I noticed a couple near our table. Having a difference of opinion about a subject most popular in Hollywood, legs. 
They moved away and I forgot them. Another act was being introduced on the stage. When Pops found the next act was not an exotic dancer, he lost all interest in the show. Well, with my escort falling asleep in my face, maybe this was the time to be nonchalant and light up a cigarette. I did. Usual result. But if a lady couldn't act nonchalant, she could at least always go powder her nose. Approaching the nose powdering department, I saw the couple which had been arguing near our table. One of them asked me for a cigarette. I might as well give them away. I couldn't enjoy them myself. The fellow explained the two of them were arguing about whether his friend, Janae, had better than average legs. To decide the argument, he wanted me to match legs. By now, I had gotten used to the gag, let's see your legs, or higher, I want to see your legs, not your feet. Anyway, the fellow voted mine better. Janae assured him he'd lost his eyesight, and I thought I had lost mine when I saw what Janae used for an ashtray. And then Janae explained what I should have known from the start. He was an impersonator, working in the show. No wonder I choked on my cigarette this time. You know something? He made a better looking woman than I did. Here's today's edition, Chief. Hot off the press. You'll find Miss Sloan's article on the fourth page. Oh, yes, yeah, there it is. We're running her picture heading the article now, just like the order. She certainly is a delectable looking dish. Out there in the wild and woolly west, she must be having a wonderful time. Yes, but I'm not so sure that. She should be out there all by herself. From what she writes, I don't think she's ever all by herself. I mean, nobody from here went with her. Is out there to watch her, watch over her. I'm beginning to wonder if I should have sent her out there all alone. In fact, why should I have sent her out, period? Pierre Martin was a nervous little man who had a wholesale lingerie house. He brought buyers here to view his showings of new styles. Modeling for him, I thought I might find some rare experiences. I did. It was nothing unusual for the excitable Pierre to stick two cigarettes in the customer's mouth and light both of them. One reason for Pierre's fluster was that we girls in the dressing room were never ready to start the shows on time. Girls! Girls, hurry, please! The, the, the men are here waiting! Girls! Say, isn't it funny the buyers are always men? Oh, it's not so strange the stores send men buyers here. After all, the kind of lingerie men go for, that's the kind women should buy. Then let's go with the first number. How long will you be? Five or four minutes. No, no. I wonder what makes him so excitable all the time. Probably working around all this lingerie. Make way for the body beautiful. You should have been parading around out there five minutes ago. You mean for something so wonderful? They can't wait five minutes? The way she's always claiming what a shape she has. 
You'd think she had my body. You'd better hurry, Jean. You follow me. I've always found that easy. Dreamer. Well, girl, here I go. No matter how impatient the buyers had become, the sight of Francine displaying Pierre's creations always had a soothing effect on them. This girl was good. A short link 90 was my first contribution to the showing. After saying good night, I blew out the candle and this closed the first half of our little show. buyers come in to buy or, or just to look. Why, dearie, don't tell me you're the type that minds men looking at you. Why, the two days that you've been here, you must have had a dozen men ask for your phone number. Or maybe the shrinking violet routine is what gets them. Yes, I'll have to try it. I'll have to convince men that I'm so very, very nice. I've got news for you. You're not that good an actress. Judith had been with Pierre longer than any other model, and she broke all the rules. I saw her giving her telephone number to one of the buyers. This girl was jealous of me, and I wondered if we'd have trouble. And I didn't have to wait long to find out. Pardon me. Say, I always wear that outfit. Well, Pierre had my name on it, so evidently you're not wearing it today. Today, too. You may be Pierre's new pet, but I'm wearing that outfit. That's silly. I already have it on. That's easily changed. I'm going to remodel. Are you crazy? Well, who started this? She started the whole thing. I didn't start it, but I'm going to finish it. Give me room. Oh, ah! <coughs> what? Be careful now, girls. Girls. Oh, 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 stop it. Stop it. Oh, oh my goodness. No, 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 about you. I, I came to Hollywood and I went to your apartment and they said you were working here. Well, I'm, I'm not exactly dressed to, to give you a formal reception. Still afraid of the big bad wolf, huh? Listen, after what I've seen and done out here, you just think you're a wolf. 
Watch me. You. Oh. Uh. Wow, you certainly have learned a few things in Hollywood. And that's only the beginning of what I've learned out here. Yes, Hollywood is no doubt just about any other city of similar size. I understand that now. But here in Hollywood, the film capital, everything seems more glamorous, more exciting, more wonderful. And if you don't believe me, come on out and let me show you. <laughs> <laughs> 